Matt, welcome to the podcast. Hello, hello. First, I just wanted to start off by asking you to reflect a little bit on the year that you've just had. Because from my standpoint, you've had an incredible year. You crushed ACR nosebleeds. You crushed GG nosebleeds. Uh, we're going to get to the GG stuff with the nosebleed games in a few minutes. But yeah, how are you feeling about the year that you've just had? Yeah, I mean, the pinnacle of it was getting on the Pat Howard podcast. <laughs> yeah, I mean, now I'm, I mean, I called my mom and told her I'm going to be on Mobius. So, You've made it. Yeah. Um, yeah, her and I are going to have a meeting after this and kind of unpack the whole experience. The um, second guest ever. It's great. It's a great honor. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's hard to top the first one, but it's all right. <laughs> I mean, I should have been on episode one. Yeah, and that was a big mistake, actually. Yeah, uh, and we save the best, save the best for last. Yeah. So we're ending the pod after this episode. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, we started the year playing ACR and um, it was just like a lot of reg battling at, uh, I guess, like 10, 20. And my average buy-in was a lot lower uh, to start the year off. Um, it just kind of seemed like the games were getting regular and regular. There were fewer and fewer fish on ACR. Um but my results over overall were still um, pretty good there. Um, a little bit of play on app games. I tried mixing things up, playing a little bit on coin poker, ignition poker. Um, in previous years, I, I think I focused more on just playing ACR, but it just seemed like that wasn't really feasible. And a lot of people were just kind of getting tired of playing the constant reg battles and dealing with the swings that kind of come from a low win rate. So... Um, it's kind of just dealing with just dealing with the the changing environment where ACR was getting tougher, both in terms of the quality of play, but also just the reg to fish ratio shifted a lot. Um, and maybe that could be something that is talked about maybe why that is, but just the game was getting a lot tougher. Um, I think it was a major benefit that the that ACR eventually kind of cleaned up the bot situation. So yeah, the games are actually. I think most people wouldn't know this, but the games are pretty clean at high stakes. Like I'm on GG or ACR, you're really not dealing with a ton of cheaters um, yeah. or bots. Which seems like reading comments and stuff like that, they think it's it's all bots, it's all cheaters. It's very, very, very few actually. Um, but it's more. I think with stuff like GTO Wizard, the pool's getting better, faster. Um, and with great content like Mobius Poker, you know, the, the game is tougher <laughs> than ever. So, yeah, it was just a combination of those things where maybe a year or two ago, there'd be fish multi-tabling uh, at high stakes, which just isn't happening now on ACR specifically. And especially at, at Nosebleeds, I mean, it, the game's kind of run around just a handful of recreational players, right? So if those people just decide to stop showing up, then those games just kind of die. Yeah, and then there's also just makes it less exciting to reg battle because there's no future value. Like, you're not going to have a fish join a reg battle randomly. And that, you know, adds to your bottom line. So at, at a certain point, you just have a bunch of sickos playing 2550 plus. There are nosebleed games that go on ACR, but it's mainly between like four or five guys um, that are just kind of battling and taking advantage of pretty much no rake at 10k plus. And so now you're taking some time off. Yeah, I I mean the benefit where the year um, was kind of saved. Well, I was already doing pretty well going into it, but um, playing on GG and playing in some really crazy nosebleed games. Um, there were some big whales playing 200, 400, and up to essentially 500, um, or I guess 100 K and L, and I ran insanely good there. Um, not much else to say. <laughs> had uh, the sickest hand uh, against Linus at the 200, 400, 800 game. That was probably one of my more memorable hands. Okay, so I pulled up this hand history and I'll just read it off. So this is 200, 400 with a straddle, right? Straddle 800. Yeah, it's a four straddle. And you are on the button. Right. Linus is on the in the small blind. Uh, we're about 90K deep, right? Yeah. Folds around to you on the button. You open uh, for 3x with ace 10 of spades. Linus, three bets to 10.5k from the small blind. And you call. Flop is 
Jack of clubs, jack of hearts, nine of spades. Linus, C bets about one third. You call, again, you have ace, 10 of spades. So you have a backdoor or straight draw, backdoor flush draw. Uh, turn is a four of spades. So you pick up a flush draw. Linus barrels again for 27K. And you call here. Pretty standard up to this point, right? Yeah. Not really like too much else that you would consider doing. Um, uh, I don't know if you should ever raise the turn, but call it seems standard to call both flop turn. Yeah. And okay, so river uh, is a six of clubs. So you brick. Pot's 92K <clears throat> on the river, it looks like, and he jams for 46. So about a half pot jam. Mm -hmm. And you, I guess let's go into your analysis here. Yeah. I mean, well, first of all, that was very brave of you to go into a verbal hand history because we both know <laughs> it's impossible to follow. Like, all right, just nod along like as if someone's telling you, forget all the cards and the sizes. Uh, let's just I, go I'll, to try, I'll try to put it up on the screen for people watching on YouTube. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I mean, on the river, obviously, I, I guess it's pretty simple. I think that he's going to check ace, queen, plus. I don't think he's ever bluffing those hands. And... I'm, I guess I just decided to go into a super simplistic thought process that would be different than if I was in a reg battle where I'm playing against the same people over and over again. <clears throat> like if there was ever a time to take the vacuum spot, this would be this would be it of just, do I think this person is over bluffing or under bluffing? Yes or no, essentially. I think he's always checking ace queen. Probably, you know, if he had spades, he maybe he's giving them up if he has like king 10 of spades and even just like knowing who I'm up against. I'm I'm basically I'm just sitting here tanking forever. And my thought process is do I think the biggest redliner of all time is <laughs> over bluffing or under bluffing against a reg he's more likely than not to see his shot taking and maybe has like one bullet for this game or whatever. Clearly I think he's over bluffing. Call. Yeah. And that's about the extent of it. It's not like this thought process I would bring into like a 2550 game where I'm much more focused on GTO. In this situation, it's like in this exact spot, in this exact scenario, do I think he's over bluffing or under bluffing? Um, I don't really know what Linus thinks of me. I probably think, I assume he maybe knows of me, but doesn't think that much of me. He's got, he's got a lot going on. He's traveling, playing Tritons. He's got <laughs> Omaha heads up matches. I don't, think he cares that much about Matt Marinelli. Yeah. Um, I think it's interesting that your thought process is so simple and also like just not really in GTO land at all. Like you're more just thinking about the uniqueness of the situation and going for an exploit. I mean, I do think that when you analyze hands, it tends to be like this. There's a, a quote by Josh Waitzkin who, the chess player, where he says, um, when he talks about grandmaster chess players, he says that they, I forget exactly what his quote is, but it's something about seeing more, but looking at less. Like they, I think you have a lot of the theory just kind of ingrained and it's intuitive mm -hmm. for you at this point. So you're kind of skipping past a lot of this stuff that is just obvious to you. Uh, and then just going into the exploitative part. But that being said, like I do think it is interesting that you, if a lot of people who are looking at this hand are not thinking that that is your thought process, that you're just saying, oh, like, yeah. how likely is this guy to, to be <laughs> trying to run me over? You know, <laughs> essentially. Well, I mean, you, okay, you went the whole Josh Waitzkin art of learning route. I would just go with, like that the caveman <laughs> route where it's like the dumb guy at the bottom of the dull curve, and then the mid guy, you know, has some overly yeah. complicated and yeah and then the genius has the same thought process as the dumb guy and like yeah that's exactly what it is like her herp to derp i think he's over bluffing <laughs> <laughs> just like call with ace high that's great so yeah um, so you call yeah. with the ace high and also i only need to be right draw. one out of you know four times or whatever if it's a half pop bet so yes and and this is for what it's worth this is a spot where people do frequently over bluff i don't know how many people are aware of that, but it, it's very common for a lot of these out of position three bet pot triple barrel spots to be like slightly over bluffed at least. Um, so definitely not a big leap at all to, especially a player like Linus to assume he would be over bluffing 
in this spot. Maybe he is, maybe he's not, but I think it's a fair assumption. Yeah. Uh, I mean, directionally, I find it unlikely he'd be under bluffing the spot. I mean, that'd be pretty yeah. baller. So I think there's a lot of asymmetry to the play. Yeah. So you called with the ace, 10 of spades, miss flush draw. Linus shows king of diamonds, queen of spades for the missed gut shot. Uh, just king high. And you scoop the 180k pot. The sick thing too is like I was literally thinking before I called like I think he's just going to overbluff king queen. And then you like <laughs> when you just click the call and he flips over the exact cards you were thinking and it's just I don't know. Uh poker's a beautiful game. What can you say? So how did that feel you know in the 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 moment after you scooped that pop? Let's take a quick break so I can tell you about my program, the Mobius GTO Stat Checker, which is now available for both MTTs and cash games. This program automatically compares your stats to solver data and pinpoints where you're off track, color coding your stats to show you where you're too passive or too aggressive compared to GTO. You can also use this program to analyze your opponent's tendencies and exploit their mistakes. For example, you can easily figure out how often your pool is bluffing on the river and therefore how often you should be bluff catching. Plus, it's great for evaluating the quality of your games. You can check the average win rate of the regulars in your pool or see how many hands in your database were played by recreational players. The Mobius GTO Stat Checker takes the guesswork out of your study routine so you can focus on fixing your leaks and exploiting the leaks of your opponents. This course includes video modules to walk you through how to use the program and a support channel to make sure that you never get stuck. You can click the link in the show notes to learn more about the Stat Checker and purchase a copy for MTTs or cash games today. Yeah, I mean, because it got posted on 2 plus 2, so random people messaged me about it being sick. And like one of my old students said, like, it has to be, he said something like, I can't imagine like a higher high in poker. And it's like, yeah, yeah no, that's pretty much describes it. <laughs> you know, like bluff catching Linus Love with ace high at 100K and L. Um, <laughs> so I, I, that's all that's all there is to say about it. Are you fist pumping? Are you jumping up and down? Or are you just kind of no. like sitting there? Yeah, because I've never seen you get really emotional at all with poker. <laughs> or is that, ever. Is that true? <laughs> um, at the tables, it's. I mean, not really. I I can't think of any time, even this year, that that's really happened. I mean, obviously, that helps be a crusher if you're just kind of yeah. stable. I mean, don't don't get me wrong; it can hurt emotionally. Um, like losing a, huge pots or big bluffs or whatever, it hurts a lot emotionally. It just doesn't reflect in my behavior or like some big reaction. Yeah, I mean, I've seen you get down and like a little bit depressed on your worst runs, for sure. Yeah. But like, I've never seen you lose it. Is that fair? Like, you don't lose your temper, and you also don't like celebrate a lot either. Uh, it's just kind of cool, even keeled. Yeah, well, that's the part about taking a break or taking time off where I can sort of give myself permission more to enjoy the win and, you know, spend a little money and actualize, like there's an actual connection to all the work that I did is um, being able to enjoy life and go out and do fun stuff. But yeah. yeah, in the midst of battle, I just try to keep it as even as possible. All right. So what parts of your game do you feel like you improved the most this year looking back now that you have some time it's hard to really pinpoint anything to what is imp what i improved this year because it's just a constant process of coming up with new strategies i i mean i think because the pool's been getting better and better i've come up with more counterintuitive and just troll strategies that you know people wouldn't be as prepared for or wouldn't be well studied like so when you say troll strategy you mean like basically choosing a an unorthodox sizing which is, is probably yeah. not it's probably not wrong like terribly bad in gto land but it's something which yeah. is off the beaten path and is not really studied by people yeah definitely so it's kind of a combination of finding strategies or sizes that people don't face often uh, but lose very little um in ev so that takes a lot of time exploring things, testing, experimenting, um, 
GTO Wizard AI has been very helpful in expediting that process, at least to start off with. And then yeah, it also makes it harder, it. right? Like because there is so much information on GTO Wizard now, you have to figure out. In some ways, it's helpful because you, you kind of have the data set that everybody is mostly studying from, right? But it's also a, a freaking huge amount of information that everybody has. So you have to kind of figure out what what would people not be studying. Yeah, I mean, some of it you can just use common sense based off of if you know if I don't face a bet size very often, I assume that other people aren't studying it. So, in a way, if things happen very infrequently at the table, and you can use like hand to note to see how often things occur, it's usually a pretty good exploit. And a lot of the times it's very big sizes or very small sizes. Um, and the only other benefit too of doing this whole experimentation is um, you actually find that the sizes that people use as standard are basically wrong. And sometimes the ridiculous counterintuitive size is actually the right thing to do. So maybe eventually the people will pick up on stuff like that and there will be just kind of evolving trends. But I guess it's just always trying to stay one jump ahead of of the competition and being willing to put people in difficult situations. Um, but my approach is a lot more scientific and trying to be well prepared. I don't really respect that like at this point in 2024 of taking like a stefan approach of just doing things completely at random and just using intuition or whatever one might do like i i think you need to because the pool is getting small smarter and better you really need to know your troll strategies <laughs> um <laughs> i'm not and i'm not the only person doing it i can see other people are kind of branching off and they have their own ideas um like, I mean, I'm not putting anyone on blast or anything, but someone like Sam Gale, you know, has a 5x open from the small blind um, and a 3.5x from the button. And I don't know. I don't know what his what his angle is, but he probably has some idea. There's some reasoning probably going into it. Yeah, and I, I think that's a big area for where you can expand into unorthodox strategies because if you look at all of the the cloud-based trainers that they, they're all kind of locked in with their pre-flop sizings and they use a lot of like legacy sizings pretty much um and, and i think that the population is getting better like people know now that you're supposed to min open from under the gun right and go bigger from the button and and like this year especially I, i've seen a lot more people catching on to stuff like that and like taking it more seriously but there's still a lot of room to improve even pre-flop with sizes yeah potentially or if not if not improve at least find alternate sizes where you know you can't even study them on gto wizard you'd have to run uh some sort of custom sim yeah i don't think it's going to happen too quickly um i mean this is just my perspective is that the average person is just even like high stakes regs are just insanely lazy and not that good. So <laughs> they're going to anything that you think should happen. You, it's going to take you just double the time it should take and then double that. And then you have how long it takes them to catch up. But hopefully by the time they come up with some new strats then I'll come up, I'll have already be three steps ahead. So yeah, that's all I can hope for. People don't like deliberate practice because it's boring yeah. and that's never going to change. That's just a part of humanity, just being a human being. So um, if you're willing to do really boring, but effective types of study and improvement, then you could probably beat high stakes poker as a, any reasonable and reasonably intelligent person could. Would you say you enjoy that work overall? Uh, even though it's boring, like <clears throat> that's sort of how I feel is that, it's when I'm building strategies, most of it is incredibly boring work, but it's worth it. And I do genuinely enjoy it. <clears throat> I think you I can like find it rewarding. Result. You know, I don't know. The answer is no, I don't enjoy it at all. I find it incredibly boring. <laughs> and the only reason I do it is because I want to be great at poker. Um, so it's just a means to an end. You know, I went to school for like film and all, and they would say, no one likes writing. They like having written. So... Right. You like having that stored off 
Um, and that it is satisfying, rewarding, however you want to say it. Um, but I do not find the process enjoyable. I want to switch gears a little bit because there's been some pretty huge news on GG Poker. So as of November 8th, it's November 11th right now when we're recording this, 2550 games and above are now closed to the public on GG Poker. Access to these games requires an invitation from GG, which so far has been extended almost exclusively to VIPs and sponsored GG pros. They have added 1020 games with a leaderboard. So previously on GG, you could play 510. There was no 1020, no 1530. It just went straight up to 5K. They added public 1020 games, but these games come with the same rake as 510, which I think is around seven big blinds per hundred, right? Yeah, probably a little more with um, the bad beat jackpot and all that. So for people who don't know, I mean, at six big blinds per hundred, you pretty much have to have a recreational at the table for the average reg to be profiting. At seven, you have to have a good recreational. And by good, I mean like uh, somebody who is uh, heading towards like whale territory uh, to justify playing in those games. Unless you have, you think you have a huge edge against the other regs, you're just going to be breaking even or losing. So, uh, what? First of all, what is your immediate reaction to this as somebody who has played a lot uh, at Nose Police on GG? Well, of course, it's going to be bad. I mean, like everyone feel, yeah, everyone feels pretty bad about it in the high stakes community. It's, you know, it's both come as a shock and was a little. A little bit expected because we've been hearing rumors about this for about six weeks um basically some emails got leaked that were sent to recreational players um inviting them to a vip game on gg and the emails were insinuating or saying directly that the vip room would be closed but it was really unclear if that was going to happen and they set a deadline saying it's going to be closed by this date and then that didn't happen so no one knew what was going on but it was kind of in the rumor mill circulating, like, what is GG going to do? Um, and when it actually hit, it kind of felt like, a, you know, for the community, at least felt like a, a Black Friday type of not the same level, but just like one of the biggest money making um, spots for high stakes poker or anything for online poker just went away um, overnight with no formal warning or explanation. Yeah, pretty shocking. I mean, this is the site with probably at least 80% of the action at these stakes, right? If not more, uh, like closer to 90. And they've just pretty much overnight just stopped running these games. Uh, to be to be fair, the mid and high stakes games, the rake is really, really high, but they're are a lot of these games running and they are still beatable. But if yeah. there's no if there's no really high stakes, that uh, I think really diminishes, first of all, just like the spectator aspect of poker, right? Because pe- people don't want to watch 510 or 1020 online. They want to watch like you and, and Linus battling out at uh, 400, 800, right? Uh, and then also, it just kind of kills the dream of getting to to really really high stakes online and and like you you still can make a very good living playing stakes like 510 or 1020 uh but it's it's a little bit yeah it's hard to overstate how that. big a motivating factor the possibility of getting to 2550 is for the average mid stake regular like they're all looking to that of yeah. being able to get to 2550 or above getting to the VIP room um I don't know what the long-term effects are going to be. And I think it's definitely going to hurt the prospect of people even deciding to get into high stakes poker or getting into poker as a career because it diminishes the home run potential. And, and why do you think that they're doing this? Because so for people who don't know, GG has been pretty, in my opinion, hostile to high stakes for a long time. Like, in April of 2023, they tried to basically double the rake overnight at 5K and all plus, and then that 
triggered a boycott. And then after like a month of negotiating with players, they reversed the rake pretty much. I think they might have raised it slightly from where it was, but pretty much reversed the rake back to the lower levels. Then a year and a half goes by and now they're doing this. So so like what is the issue with GG and, and high stakes? I guess, it, you know, since they haven't really acknowledged it formally and they're not addressing it, it's hard for us to speculate. We can just use common sense and just assume that the recreationals are losing too much money too quickly. The cost of all the transactions at high stakes is maybe just too high in acquiring these VIPs. And it would be much more profitable for them to just, you know, send the recreationals to the casino. Um, and get a much higher ROI. It's not, it's not that uncommon, you know. Chico or Bet Online, whatever uh, that network has as high as five ten, and they have a a decent sports book, as far as I know. Ignition Poker, I don't think has ever gone higher than ten twenty, and they've been very profitable, successful for whatever it is, fifteen plus years. Um, so I think there is a lot of precedent. For not offering higher than 1020. And I guess that's the direction that they're going. What do you think that says about the future of online poker? Like, do you, if you were, I know you're not a, a site operator, obviously, but if you were running a poker site, do you think there are solutions to this problem? Because it just seems like high stakes, like more and more we are hearing either directly or indirectly through their actions poker sites and operators just saying that this is not worth it is there anything that they're overlooking any other possible systems that could be put in place to make it more worth it for them well it seems at least superficially that it's a uh sensible business move i mean if you're what you're looking to do is make as much money as possible as a pure casino then you know i could see it I think people can get frustrated when there's some sort of misrepresentation where GG presents themselves as a, we're pro poker, we're trying to build the game of poker, they have GG poker in the name, and yet um, they, their actions don't line up with that and they're mainly <laughs> seeming to try to just screw casino, over like, poker. <laughs> like, like you the, bought the WSOP, like... but it's actually like, it seems like the antithesis of the WSOP. That would It seems you know, like everything is just... Meritocracy trying to funnel people into the casino like that is their their end goal uh and and also you know they're okay with printing money with high rake low admit stakes games as well yeah um and so if you're asking me if i'm an operator it depends on what my personal mission is if i want to run a casino then okay i guess that makes sense to me but there's plenty of people um i at least as far as I can tell, these CEOs that do have a part of their mission legitimately be to run a poker company. Um, and so if that, I guess it just comes down from the top. If the CEO is serious about running a poker company, then they'll make decisions that actually benefit poker, even if it isn't the most strictly plus EV thing you could do. Um I mean, yeah, at a certain so point, the, maybe you just run like a cigarette company. <laughs> you just don't care about anyone or anything. <laughs> just, um, you, but you have to actually care about poker. And I do think there are some sites that, you know, have that at least in mind. Well, Poker Stars, right, was probably the the shining. Yeah, well, that's the that gold. Yeah, every, everyone would love it if we had any site that was like pre Black Friday Poker Stars, or mm -hmm. even maybe post for like international. Um, you know, and maybe that just takes an exceptional leader to, to make that happen. Um, maybe some existing player could be that person, um, if they want to step up and make it happen. I do think that in the wake of this, there's going to be a vacuum, um, and someone could try to capitalize on it, um, especially you know if it's a free market players are not going to want to just donate their time and money to a rake fest if they are, actually aren't profiting from it 
And so if there's opportunities elsewhere, then, you know, I mean, comp if GG actually had competition sprout up, then that would be the best thing for the poker community. And that might just happen organically. Yeah. It sounds like Phil Galfon wants to be that type of leader. Uh, I know he, if you've watched his YouTube videos, he's talked about, I think his name is Isai Scheinberg, but I might be butchering yeah, sounds uh, about right. his name. Uh, but he was the one at Poker Stars who really like put poker first. And then he was ousted after Black Friday and everything went down. And Poker Stars uh, was taken over by some gaming company and, and now has they're not what they used to be put it that way um i do so i want to go back to something that you said about how they claim to be trying to grow poker and be good for poker because i don't think that the community has very much leverage in this case because gg is is it just has so much market dominance there's there's not too many other places where we can go, at least in the short term. But one thing that shocks me is the ambassadors of GG, that they haven't jumped ship yet. And, and some have, like Jason Kuhn did early, uh, I think like February of this year, he, he left GG Poker and now he just announced he's going to be an ambassador for Poker Stars. Uh, but there's still a lot that are promoting the site and I just feel like the writing it is on the wall it has been for a while but there's no denying it now that the site is just not good long term for growing poker and uh if you're somebody who came out of the poker community like you're a active or former pro and you are sponsoring this website uh not only just sponsoring it but we have sponsored gg pros playing in these exclusive games now uh, so they're, they're participating in this and they're profiting directly from it because they just have these games with all of the VIPs to themselves. Um, I don't really know how you defend that. Yeah, because, you know, you would assume that you'd feel more comfortable, you know, being an ambassador for a poker site because it's fundamentally a game of skill and gambling. Whereas I feel like a lot of people would be less comfortable, you know, being an ambassador for online slots or something, you know, but effectively that's kind of what you are. If GG really comes down to mainly being a casino and you continue to support it, then, you know, you're basically just pumping slots at that point. And maybe yeah. they don't care. And it's just, you know, maybe their perspective is they just want to make money. And I understand that. Um, I would like. I think someone like Negranu could would be that would be a significant person to leave. Um, but yeah, because his face is everywhere. Like the, he's yeah. literally built into the software. So for him to leave, I think that's like one of the only things that could really uh, <clears throat> cause GG yeah. to reconsider this approach. And also, the other ambassadors leaving would be great as well but I, I think he would be like the uh the 80 percent the pareto solution for the ambassador situation i think the main thing i mean i don't know how hands-on he is like he might just be kind of you know effectively collecting a paycheck maybe they tell him you know do this tweet x or y show up but it might not be that hands-on he might really have no idea what's going on um it would be great if someone were able to get a hold of him and explain it or, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of people that would be willing to kind of inform him so he could make an educated decision. But he, I mean, he seems like a relatively, you know, ethical person that would care about doing the right thing. Um, so it is at least possible that if he understood that how serious the situation is, that he would reconsider or at least talk to Gigi. Yeah, and for what it's worth, we haven't seen him playing in the the exclusive VIP games, right? Yeah. Uh, it's been a couple people, and I, I won't even name them yet because it's like a, a developing situation, but I, I do think that they should be named uh, 
eventually because the the thing that bothers me about it is they're pro players they came out of the community and they have specifically said like we are trying to grow poker we're going to work with gg to do what's best for poker and and then i don't understand how you go from that to effectively shutting down the highest stakes games and then just playing in them and taking all of the action for yourself that doesn't make any sense to me so i've heard some people say like the ambassadors don't owe us anything well i think you do kind of owe the community something if you're going to say things like you're trying to do what's best for poker yeah i guess if you look at you know your career or life as just a totally nihilistic power game where like we don't owe each other anything and just i don't know like our lives are all very interconnected and you know, i mean i guess i would hold them to some standards i mean i can't force them to do anything of course but i could it's i can definitely think much less of them as people yeah. <laughs> i it doesn't take a genius to figure out why they're doing what they're doing it's just because they're making a bunch of money from doing it yeah um so no definitely and and I do think that if GG just continues, like they don't go back from this, they just continue to do what they're doing. I do think players will go elsewhere, but it's difficult right now because we're not really dealing with a free market situation. We are in a, a heavily regulated market with a bunch of bullshit red tape that needs to be lifted. Um, like if... Online poker was legal in the U.S. right now. I think this would be a very different situation. I think there would be a lot more competition for GG, and they wouldn't be able to pull stuff like this. Uh, but unfortunately, we're not really in that situation yet. Yeah, for there to be a competitor, they're, they really need to be able to pull in recreational players. And that's the thing where... I like where Galfon's heart was at with everything that he tried to do and is still trying to do. But you need to be able to build a network first and foremost. And you can't really build a formidable network without drawing in recreational players. And to Gigi's credit, that's what they've been able to do. Um, so that's kind of the difference that we'd have to see is there needs to be some balance between um, attracting recreational players, but also still maintaining the integrity of, you know, the game of poker. And as I think as regs, I think we kind of understand that we have to progressively make some concessions to be able to afford that. A lot of sites are moving towards slightly higher rake structures than we've had in the past. And I think I can kind of accept it. Like if you have a network that has a substantial amount of fish, I understand that when I'm paying rake, I'm not just paying for the service of you providing the game of poker. I'm paying for access to your network. So if you have a network that has a ton of fish, then I can understand why the price of entry is higher. What do you think about a flexible rake back or reward system? Because that is like, to me, it it seems like some sort of solution like that has to happen in the future if we want this balance because we want the rake to be low enough that bricks can battle with one another. But we also understand that if you're playing 200, 400 with a whale, your hourly rate as a pro is just, it's insane. Like the hourly just explodes as you go up to nosebleeds. Of course you take on a ton more variance too. Like you can just get killed in, even not just the short term, but the medium term. So you need your hourly to be very high to justify uh, taking on that sort of uh, risk for most people. But I think the issue fundamentally is that the higher the stakes go, the more disproportional it is the money that is going to the site compared to the money that's going to the professional players. So to me, it just seems like there has to be some sort of solution which accounts for that and is flexible in either the rake or the, the rewards uh, that people get, depending on not just the stakes, but the composition of the game. What do you think about that? Yeah, I you know I think there has to be, whatever it's going to be, 
you know, compromise from regs as well. I don't want to, you know, come in and say, we need everything. We expect everything. <laughs> you just deliver me whales at 200, 400, and all I have to do is show up. Like, okay, I can understand that there needs to be, you know, higher rake or some kind of incentives or whatever, whatever it could be. I, you know, I think we have to be rational people and understand how much money that these poker sites can make from the casino aspect of it and be able to find some sort of equilibrium. So there could be things like, you know, different rake back if you're a reg or um, a fish, but that GG already has that system. It's just not transparent, which frustrates everyone. <laughs> if it was transparent, I would be okay with that. Um, they also have accounts segmented into being pros or recreational players already. And I would be okay if, you know, we're playing at the table, let's say it's all regs, the rake is lower, but then let's say a recreational player sits down and the rake, you know, goes up significantly. And that way you could maybe have the best of both worlds where you could have reg battles, but when there's a recreational player, the price goes up. Um, there could be yeah. issues with that. I mean, the legal issues, because with GG being regulated, it have to make all that transparent with the rake. But if it could be done something like that, um, that could make everyone happy. Yeah, I mean, they're, I don't know. I, I didn't think they were too transparent with the rake <laughs> as it is. They, currently, I don't right? think they could be any less. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's, of course, as convoluted as possible. It's something like 5, 10, and 10, 20, where there's like a million different bonuses and promos. Um, which, okay, if recreational players like that, if that increases the gamify aspect of it, then okay but it's very hard when you're a pro because it really adds there's variance in poker then there's variance in um your rake back as well on top of it mm -hmm. not being transparent in the first place um which is pretty difficult when the rake is very high to begin with yeah like a lot of your rewards just depend on whether or not you hit a jackpot that year or how many <laughs> of them you hit that yeah year. and then there's a daily flip -a -mint. so i mean I yeah I think WPT is a site that is sort of tuned into this and is trying different solutions, but we still haven't seen a site like really try a flexible rig system, like a true one, uh, as far as I'm aware. Maybe I'm missing one. But to me, the solution seems pretty simple. Like You can statistically identify who is a recreational player very quickly. It's it's just two basic stats, right? VPIP and PFR uh, for the most part. So as soon as you see a gap in those stats, you can be pretty sure it's a recreational player. You don't even need to do that. You can just have people label themselves when they sign up to the site. Are you playing for fun? Or are you playing as a pro? And, you know, check uh, later on. But I think most people would be honest about that uh, from the start if, if, if Lion could get you banned or something. Uh, and, and the higher the VPIP, the faster that recreational player is going to lose. So uh, like with just two stats, it seems like you should be able to calculate some sort of a flexible rake system, which is more fair, uh, which distributes the money more equally in, in kind of all situations, whether there's no fish, whether there's a very tight fish, or whether there's a whale at the table. So... I don't know why no one's tried that, but it seems like it should be possible. Well, maybe something will come from this. I mean, you, you know, all you can do is hope that something positive will, will come out of it. It's definitely a real shame because this with GG, it turned out to be the worst case scenario because we didn't know if they were just going to get rid of 2550 or what stakes in particular. But they got rid of the full VIP room. And then when they added 1020, I I always assumed they would have lower rake. I didn't think that it would be the exact same rake as 510. Yeah, that's crazy. And because they got rid of VIP room, you're going to have more crushers playing 1020. So it's just like the win rates are going to be much lower. It's, I, yeah, it's insane. I mean, that that's just kind of a slap in the face, I think. It, like... At most, the rake should be, <laughs> I don't know, five. <laughs> but like, 
every at, at every stake on GG, the rake gets lower, with the exception of micro stakes. Actually, the twenty five NL, the rake is actually really good. <laughs> uh, I don't know why. I guess they just want to like suck people in. But then you know, once you get to the, I think one hundred NL, that's when their rake skyrockets. But in in BB per hundred, it drops from one hundred NL to two hundred to five hundred to one K. It's less and less. So why would it stay the same from one K to two K? It just makes no sense. <sighs> well, at the time of this recording, it seems like the games are popping off. So I don't really know if it's just because it's new or if like people just don't have anywhere else to play. Um, I th I think people are still kind of in shock right now, uh, and and feel like they're a bit in limbo because like nothing has really even been announced about this yet. I, I mean, it's cool. Like, I, I think people wish so badly that there was just a site that had a lot of 1020 running that they could just log on and and, and the software is good and just play. <laughs> I think people want that so badly that they're willing to just be break even or slightly losing uh, for a bit. I mean, what else are they going to do right now? Yeah, I mean, they can uh, essentially they're playing 1020 Zoom. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's not the end of the world. I mean, you mentioned earlier that um, you need a fish or a whale to be able to justify playing in, let's say, something like 7BB rake environment. But it is also worth uh, considering that um, you get rake back. And so, yes, you're not effectively, they don't, you don't necessarily need a full whale that could just be like a small fish, however you want to frame it. Um, but that is a significant factor. And if you grind and get high on the leaderboard, then you could have, you know, a high rake back percentage. Which is why people yes, are grinding it. That's a good uh distinction to make. If you can break even before rake back, uh, like that's the goal in these games, basically. And then it's a pretty sweet life because you, you can make quite a bit of money off of just the rewards, assuming they keep the rewards the same <laughs> from one uh from one month to the next but it's yeah. kind of a weird situation though where you are just you're basically you have access to tons of of traffic uh like there's nowhere else where you can find these games and and the goal is to just play a lot and then break even Maybe yeah even i've heard slightly. reports that go anywhere from people that grind let's say before 510 for a living saying they found it absolutely soul-sucking up to I love it, and it's amazing. So <laughs> uh, it's highly personal. Like, I can understand why you would enjoy it, because it's the same reason people like Zoom. It's just more fun. You just sit, you're, you can just sit and play and treat it like your video game. You don't have to watch, like, three or four lobbies, and you're, like, leaving and coming back all the time. You can just kind of lock in and play your tables. So what do you think you'll do? Have you... I have no decided idea. this. <laughs> yeah, I I don't know. I'm not really sure. You were you'd planned to not even play for probably the rest of the year before this happened, right? So yeah, most likely not going to be playing, and I'll see how things kind of shake out. And come January, I'll have some plan. All right. Well, I want to close with sort of like a little state of the union as best we can for different sites because. I've asked uh, the Discord community what they wanted to hear from you, and, and a lot of people just wanted to hear your opinion on different sites. So I think we've covered GG. Um, we touched a little bit on ACR, but I'll, I'll just go down the list of these sites, and you can kind of give me a 30-second summary of how you're feeling about uh, these sites and, and if you would play them. So let's start with ACR. Yeah, um, ACR is a really tough site because there's very few fish. I think you could still make good money playing it if you're committed to it because there can can be decent rake back. Um, but most likely, I think for most people, they'd want to multi-site. Um, but at least at higher stakes, there isn't really a ton of cheating that I've seen. And it seems like they banned a lot of the bots and cash games. So I, that's something to be optimistic about. And the rake is low. So I think most people would probably have ACR, you know, in the mix and is a legitimate option. Okay. And how about 
coin poker. Uh, I know you played a little bit on there. Yeah, a, a tiny bit. Um, coin poker is under some new management, and I think most people have seen they've made a big marketing push over the past several months. It's you know they could be a competitor to GG in in the long run, depending on how they play things. Um, but they seem committed to uh, marketing and trying to grow their network. They do have at least some recreational players, which is good. Um, and they're going to be running a, a promo uh, pretty shortly. I think at the end of this month, that will it'll last for a couple months. We're fifty one hundred. Um, I don't know if I should be saying the details if they haven't uh, <laughs> haven't announced it, <laughs> but I'll just say actually that they're going to be running an event that showcases the best players in the world. Um, nice, and that should last for a significant period of time. I'll, I'll let them come out with the details, um, but that's something that's exciting. But the negative parts for uh, coin poker is that I mean I don't you know I'm not a historian. I've just been told that, you know they have some shady history, but they do have new management. So use your own judgment with that. Yeah. Um, the rake is pretty high. Um, it's not, I don't think it's a GG poker high, but it kind of goes to what I was saying before is like, as a reg, you kind of have to accept that the rake is going to be higher if you're playing in environments that have fish. So they're open to changing the rake. I've been told, um, they're going to be making some changes. Um, the other negative is that the software is archaic and terrible. Um, mm -hmm. And they're well aware of that. And I've again, I've been told that they have they are making new software and they're going to be I don't want to make any promises for them, but they are actually developing new software and it's um a high priority. They are conscious that the software is is bad. It's yeah, not that's like other sites. It's been a weird bottleneck for so many sites like ACR as well. And I really hope that the AI coding revolution helps in this regard because like it seems more feasible to me that you could just put the software into an LLM and like like it's very like I I do stuff like this a lot for simpler programs but to me it just seems very clear that like you could just run an AI on <laughs> some of these uh sites and just like make them look better without even having to worry about changing the code and like bugs and stuff uh, I don't know why they wouldn't do something like that. Yeah, I think my perspective on it is that it all comes down to the leadership. And yeah. if the leadership isn't good, then they can't sustainably make good choices and will just sabotage. So, I, I do think that there's a big opportunity for whatever site uh, rushes in to fill this this hole that's been left behind. Because uh, there's, no, there's not really a place to go for high stakes right now. Very high we stakes, we need so. the Elon Musk of online poker to just come in and just like <laughs> buy something and fix it. <laughs> yeah. And just like run a good site. Yeah, I totally yeah. agree. So okay, that's, let's, I guess basically coin poker. All right. Let's go into a couple of the other unregulated sites. So how about global? Have you played on global at all? Yeah, a very for a very brief period of time. Um, I think it's a good site actually, probably underrated. It's a little bit of a turnoff because um, they have a sweepstakes system, which is a little bit confusing at first glance, but you deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's only available, I believe, in the US and Canada. Um, yep. So a lot of people wouldn't even have access to it in the first place, but there's recreational players. I mean, I was able to find some recs at 1020. Um, it doesn't, 1020 doesn't run very often, uh, maybe once a day or something. When I when I was on there, um, yeah, there's maybe like a table or two of five ten that go off. Um, it so seems like I think it's good, usually, good yeah, usually like there's at five ten plus. It's like from what I've seen, you'll see a couple of regs playing heads up, like hoping yeah. a, a, a fish sits, and but for the most part, it's like fish sits down at ten twenty. The game runs for like thirty minutes around them like you have one table <laughs> uh, maybe yeah. two and then they leave and then everyone else leaves so it's it's kind of dead currently uh for 1k plus i mean even even two five i don't think you could get 
full volume in as a one two player just with that site but it's a good site to fill in yeah that's I, that's what i would say i don't think it's like a main site type of thing the yeah. only thing that's sort of annoying um is i felt like the time bank was kind of short so it might be yeah. kind of hard to like have a bunch of different sites um but i just see it as like it's a site with reasonable rake because there is rake back along with it um and there are recreational players um so I wouldn't rule it out. That's why I'm saying it's underrated. Um, if you have recreationals and you have reasonable rake, that's like half the battle. Yeah, I mean, I, I heard from some people, some people have reached out to me and they said last year, just playing one, two, they did very well. Like made <laughs> like, a, like a good <clears throat> mid to high five figures, just mostly playing one, two on that side. Yeah, so, I don't want to put out, because there's no HUD, there's no... But, the just looking at the game quality, if you game selected, I feel like I don't know, a person could win for like 10 BB if yeah. or something similar to like old school ignition. Yeah. Before the bots. Okay, let's let's do ignition real quick. How are you feeling about them currently? Um well I mean in terms of the security, they've done nothing that I'm aware of and the bots are still out there. Um so it's very hard to recommend. I kind of tell people that it could be extremely profitable. Um, but you just have to be aware that you are getting cheated. Essentially, you're basically playing in an app game with no security. Yeah. So you're going to be able to find whales that you're not elsewhere. You could. It could be another sleeper site where there's just not a ton of public information about it. And the people that are crushing aren't going to be, you know, bragging about it in the forums. So we don't really know what is possible there, except the only thing we know for sure is that there's definitely fish or definitely big whales. You won't get anywhere else. And there's definitely bots. Yeah. So you kind of have to just give it a shot and see, uh, see how it goes for you. Or just don't. <laughs> well, or I think don't. The... Yeah, like the issue is you you know you're playing with two or three bots per table. And even if you are profitable, I, I think most people it would just get into their heads too much. And they will just spin out mentally if they know they're getting cheated. Like it takes an extremely strong player to sit in those games and know that like, okay, the bots aren't going to win very much off of me. I'll deal with them and uh, probably be winning against the other regs and then be crushing a whale if a whale sits down. Like, if you're a top tenth of a percent poker player, that's that seems pretty natural to you. But like, if you're an average, <laughs> if you're just an average reg, uh, I just think it's a really bad idea to go on that site. Yeah, I think if you had a CFP that was really focused on we're going to put people on ignition, we know about the bots, because you really need to have some probably some kind of social proofing or social influence to give you some confidence, especially if the the stable that you're working with was winning. And you can see like, okay, we're winning as a group, we have some system, because as far as I know, they're exploitative bots, or at least somewhat exploitative. I don't know if that's changed. Yeah. Um, but you could potentially get some info on them where you could neutralize them essentially more info on them and more peace of mind that if you do go on a big downswing you're probably just running bad if you know your your stable buddies as a whole are winning uh, whereas if you're just a lone wolf you can just get crushed for a hundred thousand hands and you just have no idea if you're losing to the bots because they're crushing you or and, and cheating against you or if it's just variance so it's just a really bad <laughs> mental situation to, to be in yeah it's hard to say because we just don't know what what the reg win rate is it's all anonymous there's no data on it so it's just a big question mark yep okay stars and party i poker win max you don't play on any of those sites yeah right? i don't really have a, a ton of insight regulated us stars and party very good right now um i think i poker also has a bot issue. Um, I'm not sure about Winamax. I don't even know if we... We don't know very many people who play on Winamax currently. I don't want to know them. <laughs> um, iPoker, 
I think it's still also still profitable. It's like kind of the same situation as Ignition. Uh, and then WPT Global seems like it could be promising, but uh, sort of like a coin poker. Like yeah, the, the rate kind is still of a wait high. and see. Like, are they gonna kind of? Is this like a pass the baton thing from GG to someone else, where where someone could take this and run with it? Um, yeah, there are definitely you know, I, I'd say comparing them to coin poker seems valid except as far as i know wpt has way more traffic they're more legit also yeah. they're like better security i would imagine much better mm. but well at least well, they have their own that's issues. what they advertise <laughs> <laughs> um listen they have ai uh yes security <laughs> the power of artificial intelligence <laughs> um if people want to learn more about wpt global i did an interview with the president and their security lead um, Alex Scott and John Andres. So you can watch that podcast. I think it was two podcasts ago. And on a brighter note, there is, well, there's two new sites coming out, right? There's Bet Rivers, which is Pennsylvania. Um, but mm -hmm. then there's also WBT Gold, right? Yeah, I think and something like that. That's a new sweepstakes based poker site, which is going to be available in the US and Canada, um, except for Quebec and a few other US states. So that could be huge if you're in North America. Yeah, we'll have to see how it goes. I don't know, like it needs more traffic than global poker, but well, I mean, maybe the brand is strong enough. Um, but, you know, like I said, I think it all comes down to management how smart they are, how good they are. And then with Bet Rivers, it's just hard to say because it's if they're just operating in Pennsylvania right now, it's such a small market. Um yep. I guess it could have implications in the future if they're able to establish of like having no rake or whatever the premise is and they can prove that that's profitable, then that's a very interesting prospect. Yeah. And I like that it's extremely contrarian. <laughs> so Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they claim hard. they're gonna have no rake for a few months, so yeah. So they'll in two months they will have failed, <laughs> and, <laughs> and proven that better, more rake is better. So thanks, Galfon. Literally right, just well... ruining poker. <laughs> <laughs> I think on. it's that type of thing where you know you can't have a you need a politician or like a business person that is a little bit corrupt. You can't be like too squeaky clean. You got to be a little bit corrupt to make things work. Yeah, well, Galfon's sites do seem like they've been kind of idealistic. So I, I wish him all of the success in the world. Like, there's nobody that I would rather yeah, be at the top. Yeah, it sounds, just sounds great. Just I just don't want it to capitalism. be a bunch of nice people high-fiving each other about how great a job they're doing. Like, you need to yeah, it's At the end of the day, money. it's capitalism, right? Yeah. But yeah, I do think um, WPT Gold is is something to look forward to. All right, so any words of encouragement before we wrap up? Oh my up? God, words of encouragement? I mean, personally, I, I feel like I'm going to be okay. <laughs> you know, I, you can't keep the good ones down, and I think you should have the same mentality for yourself to uh, not be too worried. Um, if there's someone will come up with something, I do believe that there's going to be some avenue. I'm particularly excited um, because I'm involved with getting, like, participating in this coin poker event. Um, that that does give me some hope and that it's happening so quickly. It's almost not that they planned it this way, but it's almost in response to GG kind of screwing over regs. It's like, all right, now we're going to do this and we're going to showcase what makes poker a great game. I mean, listen, the country is going bankrupt, right? So mm -hmm. what we're we going to have to we're going <laughs> to have to legalize online poker at some point. That's my view. <laughs> we're going to have to re-legalize it. That's that's we'll my see. only that's my one political stance that I will share publicly is that I actually root for all government spending. The more reckless, the better, because I just think that the sooner the country goes bankrupt, the, the faster we'll have to legalize online poker again, and we'll be back. <laughs> yeah. I mean, desperate situations yield the quickest results. So something will happen. No, but I do think that like, Black Friday was sort of a fluke. Like that's obvious given that we have sports betting as big as it is now. It was like 
special interest groups lobbying their way into legislation and hopefully that will be reversed sooner as opposed to later but for now I, I think you just have to just keep going to like you have to think of yourself sort of as like a traveling musician or something like you just have to keep going to the keep next hustling. venue <laughs> keep hustling and that's what we've been doing for the last five years right and it's it's worked out very well so the, the, for as much doom and gloom as there has been with Ray getting higher and and cheating and like all of these different scandals it's still very possible to do very well in online poker and um i don't think that's just going to go away overnight the game is stuck around for a reason yeah people love to play poker it's as simple <laughs> as that and if if a site tries to ruin poker the people will go to another site where they can play actual poker i would love to have you back on sometime this has been really fun and thanks for thanks for coming on yeah no problem